Would you like a DTNS hat, hoodie, mask, or mouse pad? We got them all. The DTNS store, dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. Coming up on DTNS, Intel's impressive Alder Lake chips are finally real. Some context to bring to your reading of the Facebook papers. And Scott Johnson breaks down all the news from Adobe Max. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 27th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We're talking about noodles, all the noodles that uh, Scott sent to Sarah Lane uh, to eat. If you want to hear about those noodles, get Good Day Internet. Also talk a little bit about my new M1 Max uh, MacBook. That's at patreon.com slash DTNS, where you can join our top patrons like Dustin Campbell, Tim Deputy, and Brandon Brooks. Big thanks to all of you. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Microsoft announced plans to expand the number of data centers it operates around the world while reducing the amount of water it uses to cool its data centers by 95% by 2024. Microsoft has pledged to replenish more water than it uses by the end of the decade. So halfway through the decade, this will get them pretty close. The Verge notes that a typical data center uses as much water as a city of at least 30,000 people per day. To reduce water cooling, Microsoft plans to set higher temperature limits based on some intense research it did about how warm a data center could actually get and still run well. That alone, they think, might get them uh, where they want to be in the cooler climates, you know, like the Netherlands. But in warmer, drier regions, Microsoft will also plan to implement a closed-loop immersion system that uses fluorocarbon-based liquid baths. You know, uh, you may say, like, my refrigerator used to do that. This is a little different at the scale of a data center. Uh, that system is still in research and development right now, and the team ran its first tests on it in April. 30,000 people worth of water. Wow. That's one epic. Uh, that's a lot. Every product release, and particularly high-profile releases like those from Apple, they usually come with some sort of defect meme, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's uh, antenna gate or what have you. Yellow you're, you're, Sure, all these things are, are always, they always come up. Well, the new MacBook Pros have a notch scandal. Social networks abound with shocked and outraged videos of menu bar items disappearing and becoming inaccessible behind the laptop's notch. Ah. Oh no, what are we to do? Uh, meanwhile, I fix it stumbled upon some happy news in its teardown of the M1-based MacBook Pros. Uh, the battery has pull tabs. <gasps> and uh, yeah, that might mean what you think it means. A couple of the battery cells are under the trackpad assembly, but the others are not. And none of them are glued or screwed in there. Looks like the battery in the new MacBook Pro is indeed replaceable. So your menu items are temporarily inaccessible. You can replace <laughs> the battery, folks. Stop your whining. Uh, while Facebook made billions last quarter, it did note reduced advertising revenue attributed to the change in how Apple allows third-party tracking, which means you have to get someone to agree to it. You can't just slip it in there anymore. Uh, same was true for snap they noted the same effect twitter on the other hand was fine in fact twitter reported a 37 percent jump in q3 revenue overall and ad sales rose 41 percent year over year twitter cfo ned legal noted that the ad ecosystem is still uh adjusting to apple's change but said this has been less of a factor for us uh, Twitter also wasn't impacted by supply chain issues, which depressed some other advertising as well. So Twitter relies largely on brand ads, uh, not targeted ads, for digital goods and services, which are not affected by supply chain. So Twitter's golden. However, Twi Twitter did report a net loss in the quarter based on a $766 million cost of settling a class action lawsuit from 2016. Uh, that lawsuit alleged that Twitter misled advertisers. They settled that. So if you see that they lost a lot of money, that's why. Uh, otherwise, they did well. I think of a guy named Legal works in your uh, accounting department. I hope there's a guy named Money who works in the legal department. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. DJI announced the His Action 2 Siegel, camera. Legal, not legal. That was, that, <laughs> oh, was me, that was me saying it wrong. <laughs> uh, DJI announced the Action 2 camera, dropping the Oslo name and adding a magnetic system for accessories. The 53-gram Action 2 module has a 12-megapixel sensor for 4K recording, so that's pretty good, a 155-degree field of view, and a 1.7-inch Gorilla Glass OLED touchscreen. It comes with 32 megabytes of storage as well. Available accessories include additional touchscreens and batteries and mounts. 
The Action 2 bundled with a second screen is coming November 2nd for $519. And a bundle with just an extra power module is coming mid-November. That one for $399. My apologies to Ned Siegel. <laughs> Uh, the U.S. Copyright Office published its once every three years list of exemptions to the U.S. Digital Millennium Copyright Act. These are a list of things that you can legally circumvent copyright protection in order to do. Most of the items that were already on the list were renewed. That includes things like ripping a DVD for educational use, unlocking a cell phone. But the office also uh, replaced a list of items you were allowed to circumvent copyright protection to repair uh, they had a list of these are the items you can do that with. And now they just have a broader definition that applies to any consumer device that relies on software to function. So if it's a consumer device, you're pretty much in the clear to fix the software anyway, uh, as well as non-consumer devices, things like medical devices, sea and land vehicles. Uh, there's a list of those. So not every non-consumer device, but there's a broader list of those. Basically, if it uses software, you can circumvent copyright protection to diagnose, maintain, and repair your device. Now, there are some limitations. Uh, video game consoles, for instance, only allow you to repair the optical drive, uh, and any circumvention that you do after you're done repairing the optical drive has to be put back in place. So you can't repair the optical drive and then rip all your games. Uh, the office also expanded exemptions for making video accessible, uh, preserving disk-based media, uh, allowing uh, people who can't see uh, to, to circumvent ebook copyright protection so they can do text-to-speech, stuff like that. Slow right. and steady wins the race for these changes. That's how they do it. Slow yeah, and steady. Yeah, and Library of Congress uh, has been has been pretty good at listening to appeals from places like the EFF, in other words. Uh, let's talk about those new chips. Intel announced its line of 12th Gen Alder Lake chips. Uh, the top-level processor is the i9-12900K. In fact, Intel calls that the world's best gaming processor. Uh, these are the chips that Intel promised at CES in January, uh, gave us details about in July at Architecture Day, and today you can buy them. We aren't going to run through every single model, but here's the overview. Uh, the Core i9 top level, the 12900K, offers 16 cores split evenly between the P cores, the performance cores, and the E cores, the efficiency cores, 24 threads, clock speeds of 5.2 gigahertz, and Intel promises a 19% performance improvement over the 11th gen, uh, there's a Core i7 version that has 12 cores and 20 threads. Core i5 has 10 cores and 16 threads. You can get all three of those with or without integrated graphics. It's a KF in the uh, in the model number if it doesn't have the GPU on there. All three of these uh, give you up to 20 PCIe lanes, support for DDR5 memory, and larger L3 and L2 caches. So fast and future-proof for the most part. But you'll need a new 600 series motherboard, preferably the Z690 chipset if you want flexible overclocking. That adds Wi-Fi 6E and the faster USB 3.2 data transfer, but it also may require you to add a new cooler. They all run a base of 125 watts, but can spike higher with the i9 hitting 241 watts. Uh, Intel promises other big improvements if you run Windows 11, thanks to the co-development of Thread Director. Uh, that intelligently assigns tasks to the right core, the P or the E core. Another notable thing is Alder Lake chips are built on Intel's 10 nanometer process. I think I've been talking about this since Buzz Out Loud, but they finally did it. 10 nanometer process, uh, not the previous 14 nanometer process. And if you recall, this is the process that Intel calls Intel 7 because nanometers ain't nothing but a number to Intel. <laughs> so if it's 10, they're just going to call it 7. Uh, they want you to believe their design is just as good as another company's 7 nanometer process, and it might be. The benchmarks will tell, but it is pretty impressive. Uh, there's more to come with Alder Lake's mobile versions are coming in 2022. We'll probably get details about those at CES. Top of the line i9 12900K costs you 580 bucks, 589 bucks with integrated graphics or 564 without and the cheapest i5-12600 without graphics is $264. Pre-orders start today, shipping November 4th. Roger, I know you followed this stuff really closely. Uh, how, how do you feel about this? Everybody seems to think this is a positive Intel announcement. Do you agree? This is one of the, this is the first time where I've seen Intel not just playing catch-up, but like 
and and this is this is the thing that the, their primary competitor at this point is AMD, and despite what you know Apple has uh, has unveiled, you know for for Intel they they need to make sure that they can at least uh, uh, beat their, their 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 closest competitor AMD, and and they well it depends on on the actual benchmarks, but it looks like they've come out with a full slate of performance enthusiast products uh, that can go toe to toe with what AMD has right now. Um, I mean, this is this is this is a, this is a seismic shift for a lot of people because for for so long, Intel has been very content in doing very gradual, you know, minor tweaks and updates. And with the with the failure of their uh, previous attempts, at- mm, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're fail- we yeah, lost you for a they, second there, Intel's Roger. Finally but got it with it. Uh, you oh, you said their failure at their previous attempts uh, at, 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 at moving to a smaller process, a manufacturing process, that might be behind them if they can get these 10 nanometer chips out in scale, not just a small selection of them. That's really good. I think this 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 could be the this is a sign that you know Intel watchers have been waiting for. Like, what is Intel going to do? AMD's coming down. Apple switched over. You know, a bunch of other companies are looking at producing in-house chips. You know, this is this is a good sign, and they work really closely with Microsoft to ensure that that uh, that Windows 11 runs as smoothly as possible on all these new chips. Yeah, and, and in fact, uh, Gelsinger was was very positive about the the yields on this. Uh, he he was not talking about any any restrictions, even with supply chain issues. You would you would expect him to talk about restrictions, but he's talking about you know shipping a couple million of these things. Uh, so it 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 does seem like. Uh, I, I, it would be unlike an Intel engineer to do a happy dance, but you know the closest thing to it in, in this announcement, right? I mean, they set a goal, and I think they're meeting them, and that's yeah, huge for them. Well, good uh, luck also, to them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger said Moore's law is alive and well. Today, we are predicting that we will maintain or even go faster than Moore's law for the next decade. Uh, if you don't know, Moore's law is a famous observation that the number of transistors on a processor doubles every two years. People act like they know what Moore's Law is. They usually use it to mean a doubling of performance, which eh, transistors and performance are, are, are pretty linked. Moore's Law was coined not by Roger Moore, the actor, but uh, engineer and co-founder of Intel, Gordon Moore. Uh, Gelsinger, also an engineer, was literally talking about the number of transistors on a chip. Uh, and had a graph to go with his assertion, he doubled down, promising acceleration to super Moore's law. <laughs> so, slow down, Pat. Regain the market lead first. But uh, pretty, pretty positive there. Yeah, it seems kind of exciting. It might impact gaming. Let's talk about a couple of pieces of information that may happen in a data center full of Intel chips. I don't know. A couple of streaming pieces of news here. Google Stadia added support for free trials of individual games. First one gives you 30 minutes of Stadia's exclusive title, called Hello Engineer. Uh, all you need is a Google Hello, account. Hello, Pat Gelsinger. <laughs> yeah. uh, all you need is a Google account. During the 30 minutes, you get the full game, uh, though there is a little sidebar with a timer. I think that's actually kind of a weird idea. Hopefully, it's not too intrusive. Whatever progress uh, you make is saved in case you want to buy the game. So they'll keep that in the cloud. Uh, Hello Engineer is 20 bucks normally on Stadia or available in the Stadia Pro subscription service. They've done that so far with their uh, their internal games. Google says this is a test and that they will bring it to other games with other time lengths attached to those games. In fact, not everybody may even see the same game available for a free trial at any given time, which is a, a little weird, but we'll see what they plan with that. Meanwhile, and here's the, I think, the more interesting news in streaming games. Samsung announced it will launch a cloud game platform for its Tizen-based smart TVs. There were no details on any kind of launch date, what games would be available, any kind of partnerships there or if it will launch on other platforms. But Samsung did seem to imply this would be a PC slash console level sort of focus for games, not seeing this happen on mobile, which is interesting. I think there may still be room for a tie-in there in terms of remote gaming, but uh, the focus seems to be uh, consoles and possibly PCs. I don't know how you feel about this, Tom, but I feel like if there's one part of cloud gaming that hasn't been tapped very well, it's been a more international aim uh, for for a product like this, when we talk about XCloud and Stadia and and uh, Enforce or GeForce Now, all these different services, we're usually talking about the U.S. markets and often European markets, but not necessarily places like India and China and all all these other markets that have huge potential with old hardware that want to play new games and do it in this new cool way. 
and they often have better internet infrastructure in a lot of these places. So I think Samsung's got a chance to do something big here, um, and I don't think this is a small announcement. No, that's a good point about about the international market, uh, and and I think there's another uh, another aspect of this as well, which is, granted, Samsung's telling us nothing about this. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if Samsung isn't using Stadia's white label service to do this, and they're just not ready to announce that part yet. Uh, but this strikes me as a a logical follow on to including apps on your smart TV. Uh, we have gotten to the point where. You you might have been skeptical about it, but people are using apps on their smart TVs. They they really are. Uh, it's it's got a huge uptake, and some people prefer that. I don't understand them, but some people prefer that over a set top box like a Roku, uh, so or even a, a smart stick. So I think this is clever to be like, yeah, and you know what else? We can get a lot of people doing PC and console level gaming if we just package a controller with the smart TV and mm -hmm. say, look. You can play these games. You don't need to go buy anything special. You can just use your TV. You know, it's a service you'll pay for. We'll rake in a little money off of that, sure. But it comes with your TV, and you don't have to add anything to it. Uh, that, I think, could become a big selling point for televisions. Yeah, and it, the, the infrastructure of a television, having all those apps available to it, like my LG does, tells me that the gateway is already there. It's just a matter yeah. of having the service up and running because what are you doing? You're streaming content and sure this is a very different interactive kind of stream, but it's happening and it's real and they got a lot of TVs and monitors in the world. I think they're in a really good position if they want to try something. Yeah. I, I expect that there, there will still be people who want to add a box. They want to add an Xbox. They want to add a Roku. They want to add a fire TV, whatever. But uh, I, I do think this could, could potentially become another avenue into gaming for a lot of people who are like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. I'm just going to do the cloud gaming thing that came with my Samsung TV. Mm -hmm. All right. Casey Newton had some good points to consider on his platformer newsletter. Uh, if you're thinking about the Facebook papers released by Francis Haugen, we've covered those extensively this week. Newton talked to a former, that's important, not, not a current insider, but a former Facebook integrity team worker about the source of some of the posts being quoted in these articles. Now, former workers like Francis Haugen have been blowing the whistle on Facebook, but there's a different take coming from the worker that Casey Newton talked to. A lot of the cited posts in these articles you're seeing come from Facebook's workplace system. Workplace is, is something that Facebook markets to businesses uh, as a work appropriate version of the Facebook platform, kind of an intranet, a little bit like Slack, a little bit like Teams. It's sold for workplace communications and it's used within Facebook. The worker told Newton that since the names and the job titles are redacted in these stories, rightly so, it is hard to tell which posts are credible and which are someone just spouting off, which does happen, certainly on things like Slack and Teams and one we've guessed on Facebook's own workplace. The worker said, this doesn't mean the posts shouldn't be reported. There just needs to be more context around them. Here's a here's a few of that, that worker's points. These aren't leaked documents all the time. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they're presentations or research. But a lot of times they're just posts and comment threads. And the reports tend to treat all of those equally. And they're not. Anyone can post anything at any time on Workplace, just like on Facebook proper. And not all posts are well thought out. And not all posters know the context of what they're posting about. Some do, but not all. So they're not all equally credible. If someone's saying something about Facebook in a post, that doesn't necessarily make it true. Just like when someone says something on Facebook, it doesn't necessarily make it true. Facebook Workplace needs some of its own fact checking, I bet. Uh, something positioned as an internal debate in a Washington Post story might have originated just as some off-the-cuff venting by an employee who was procrastinating getting back to work. We all do it, right? Uh, Newton has more in his newsletter if you want to get uh, more of the details and more of what that worker uh, thinks. But suffice to say, it's worth remembering that context is important when reading these statements. Uh, journal journalists could do a better job of pointing out this was a comment thread that this was set in versus this was a presentation made to executives. Uh, but it's it's also, as a reader, I think, important to take that into account. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, it's easy to say, uh, I've been going through some of this on, uh, on my own, with some, some of my own stuff with chat rooms and things. It's easy to say, well, these are damning documents because they've come out, they've been leaked, and they're people saying things to each other. I can't believe they said these things. And my take would be, 
we can't have everything perfectly PR prepared to function as a as a as a people or as corporations or as just small businesses. Sometimes you just need to hash stuff out in an environment where you're not you're restricted by maybe some common sense stuff. Like you're not being rude to each other. You're saying terrible things, being sexist, whatever it may be. But being able to kind of speak your mind about a project, I think is really important. And and the idea that that's somehow, um, I don't know, controversial that people have these internal discussions, I think is just blowing it way, way out of proportion. Now, if somebody says something crazy, you get Zuckerberg in there saying something that just really rocks the foundation of social media or ethics or something that they told Congress, but they actually do. I mean, that's different. And you can do that paper trail or whatever. But most of the time, this is like you said, this is like some Slack-like conversation. And sometimes those need to happen in their kind of raw, you know, uh, organic form so you can get stuff done. Yeah. And I, and, I don't and, want and us so to be afraid of that. When you're, when you're doing, when you're doing a, a post about the Facebook papers, papers makes it sound like, ah, this is a stack of official documents. I think... I think reporters need to work extra hard to point out now this portion, this thing that was said was a comment thread uh, and comment threads are, are not this don't have the same weight as an official document, official presentation, a thing said in a meeting, et cetera. Comment threads are great for in the meeting someone said, right? And that that could be useful, but they're not the same as here's an official pronouncement or here's what people think, right? Just a couple of posts are not representative of what people think. And again, this doesn't invalidate these stories that we've been hearing uh, out of Facebook in any way. And that worker was not trying to say that. It's just to say there are certain parts of them that, are a little more solid than other parts. And as a reader, uh, be aware of that when you're, when you're forming your own conclusions about what you believe about this. Yep. Nuance matters as always. Yeah. Uh, folks, we talk about the stuff we think will help you understand technology better. Uh, but we also want to know what you want to hear us talk about on the show. And the, one of the best ways to let us know is our subreddit. Uh, you can get in there and submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You want more? I'm thinking you might be getting tired of the Facebook papers. Maybe you want more. Let us know dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. As we mentioned yesterday, Adobe Max is underway. There's a web version of Photoshop and Illustrator. There's a rollout of Adobe's content credentials for taking images with authorship and edit records and even validating them as NFTs. Wednesday, Adobe did its more forward-looking announcements of technology, uh, aka sneaks. These are things that might make it into Adobe projects someday. They also might not. Uh, we're going to run through a few of these uh, with Scott and then get his overall impressions on Adobe Max. Let's start with Project Morpheus, which is for video what Adobe's neural filters are for images. Project Morpheus can tweak things in a video <clears throat> like how old someone looks or their hair color or their facial expression. Their demo showed taking someone who is not smiling and making them smile. Uh, it can also add facial hair or glasses uh, there's a limited number of tweaks, and the subjects all have to be facing the camera. So this isn't a widespread, full, deep fake, uh, but it could be used for good, like fixing a bad take in a movie, uh, or it could make a prisoner look super happy and content, which would be a bad use. But uh, you know, generally speaking, what do you think of this, Scott? I think it's just a natural extension of what Photoshop has always been, even without the AI and machine learning. It's always been an opportunity to change a frown to a smile to use just a simple example, but um, when my daughter was one and we were taking family pictures, she did not want to be there and cried the whole time. And when we were done, I took a shot of her smiling separately and I Photoshopped it on there. We printed giant form <laughs> versions of this and gave it to my parents and they never knew the difference. And I would call that doing some good with this otherwise, you know, maybe sometimes unseemly use of the technology. Um, I don't think this is a, a weird uh, extension at all. In fact, I'm a little surprised that we haven't gotten to this stage sooner with, with Adobe specifically, because I think the future is if they want to stay as relevant as they are, they got to just keep adding to this machine learning stuff. So I think it's cool. I mean, it's not full deep fake. It's, it's closer to it. And I think people are going to find plenty of good uses for this. It's too easy to sort of attack it outright. So, uh, you know, give that some time. Strike a pose is the next one uh, where you have a picture of, say, Scott with his hand pointing up in the air at a duck. Uh, and you have a picture of me looking straight ahead with my hands at my side. And you want to make a poster with my serious pose 
but you need it to be Scott, not me. And you and you uh, you don't want to make Scott reshoot the photo, so you can use Strike a Pose to change the Scott photo into the same pose as the Tom photo. Adobe Sense AI fills in all the details, like like changes in how his clothing would drape, facial expressions, and everything. Uh, they even did a, an example of it turning a model around to face the other way. So they had a model facing the camera, then they had a different model facing backwards, and they used this to turn the first model to face the other direction. Yeah, the, de the demo was actually pretty impressive. Um, I'd argue that just like almost any of these features or features that have preceded any of this, in practice, it's often more difficult. And if you've got a noisy background, sometimes the AI yep. is not going to perform well. And putting all that to the side, this, this is a great uh, way for them to say, and I think this maybe the whole Max conference is trying to do this, um, but this is a great way for them to say, hey, the CC subscription, which a lot of you might think is kind of expensive, and it kind of is. And you got to lock it in like you do an old cable subscription. It's, you know, it's a little bit unwieldy. Here's some new great reasons we think that this is worth your monthly money. And this is one of those. Uh, Project Morpheus is one of those. This is them separating themselves. If or they ever make apart. it into Creative Cloud, we should point out, Correct. we should reemphasize that these are not in there yet. They're, That's yeah. a good point, right. But I think they really, I mean, their, their bread and butter will be the future of that service. And it continually setting them apart from everybody else who may have a competing package of video editing, sound editing, uh, you know, photo editing types of software, which I dabble a lot in. And these things are really compelling. Uh, like you say, they're not in CC yet, but the idea is that these features would maybe start to show up. And, and I think that's a natural transition for them. Uh, last one I want to mention is Project In Between. Uh, this lets you take two or more photos and combine them to make an animation. They only said two or three. Maybe maybe the max is three. Uh, this is kind of similar to what a phone does when you take a burst photo and then it picks a keyframe and then later it'll say like, you want to make an animated GIF out of it, and it takes a couple of those those frames from the burst and and makes an animation. It's that, except you don't have to do the burst. This could be like, man, I took three photos of my dog and none of them are great. Well, you could use this to make a little animation out of it using Adobe Sense AI. Uh, they don't have to be taken as the same batch, although it may get weird. You know, if you've got a flower in your dog, it's just going to, you know, <laughs> morph. Uh, you choose the number of transition frames. That'll make it faster or slower. Uh, Adobe sees the main use of this as transforming these accidental photos on your phone uh, and making a GIF out of them. Uh, so, so what do you that, think of that and, and Adobe Max in general? Well, I think it's funny that we're we're still making GIFs and better ways to make them. I just think that's kind of hilarious um, <laughs> for that format. But but uh, I would say this is basically tweening. This is high fidelity tweening is what they've described here with this in between. Essentially, they're saying object number one needs to get to object number two, fill in the blanks. And that's what we used to do in Flash and you know every other animation software. They call it tweening. I can't believe they've done it, but it looked to me like they've kind of done it. They've created like real <laughs> photorealistic tweening, and that's crazy. In terms of my overall take on the conference, um, specifically from day one, they, them uh, going forward with a, a public facing sort of web based, well, not sort of entirely web based version of Photoshop and Illustrator, possibly more apps in the future, even though they're not fully featured. Uh, but featuring collaborative tools and that sort of thing, that's absolutely huge. That's gigantic because a lot of these, a lot of people who use their products count on that kind of collaboration. And right now it's sending a lot of PSDs back and forth with Behance or otherwise. This means, in theory, they can pull stuff up and across the country somebody can make some small tweaks from where they are and all your stuff is, is you know, remains unscathed and you've got the file and you're good to go. I think that's a gigantic value add. And really, of all of these things, a lot of them are kind of pie in the sky, really interesting tech and everything. But that's the most like rubber meets the road decision I've seen them make in a long time. And I think that translates to actual like subscription upticks in a more meaningful way and faster. So uh, overall, I think that's the entire point of Max is to get people excited about signing up for CE or CC. But mm -hmm. I think that that day one stuff is maybe the most interesting in terms of what I can do right now and today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that makes sense, right? The R&D stuff you can't do, so you're going to be less excited about it. So, yep. um, and, and it sounds like you got kind of excited. I kind of did, and I kind of have to, I'll, I've said it on the show before, but I've kind of moved to some other alternate alternatives lately. I still have some of the Adobe stuff, but I'm paying a lot less for it, and I'm using other apps in their place. I have to admit, some of this stuff, and a web version of Photoshop, is very compelling for a lot of stuff I do. 
So it's it's doing its job of maybe bringing some who have who veered away a little to try alternatives to maybe uh, maybe I shouldn't leave so soon. So I think that's a good thing for them. They got to keep innovating in that direction to keep me around. All right, let's check our mailbag. Uh, great discussion in our Discord yesterday relating to yesterday's show uh, where Trisha Hirschberger was showing off her, her new Pixel 6. Uh, Matthias said, how fair is it to review the Pixel 6 camera at the present and compare it to other phones? On one hand, it's completely fair because it's a product they're selling right now. On the other hand, so much of the Pixel camera magic was the AI to the extent that Google didn't want to update the camera hardware for years because the AI was so well-tuned. Is there an argument, and, and Matthias is just asking the question, is there an argument that any camera comparison should have an asterisk and a required follow-up in three to six months? I would say yes to the asterisk. The thing is, all all cameras are software are, are software reliant. Whether it's a standalone point and shoot or a DSLR or the one on your phone, software is a big part of how the image comes out. And so I think, yeah, it, you 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 should you should update it every time there's a new firmware update. There's some new software addition, but you do it at that point because until that point, that camera is what you have. Of, uh, currently available on that phone, on that uh, on that device, and so I mean, yeah, I mean, all products need to get regularly reevaluated as software becomes a pivotal part of how they function. The bigger yeah. the bigger question is like, when is it fair to say, yeah, we can now review that thing because we think it's as complete as it's going to be, or as good as it's going to be, even though they update it. And I would compare this, maybe unfairly, but compare it to like a brand new MMO style game. They're never great, as good at launch as they're going to be in a year or two years. And so you always see a lot of reviews in progress or mm -hmm. a review so far. Or someone will say, a 2021 review of this 2011 game. See how it is nowadays. Um, I think we're heading that way with a lot of these sorts of things. Like, why not look at that camera in five years and say, well, how did it end up? And, and, and you just kind of yeah. refresh your review, take a new take on it. I, I think Matthias has got a great point about, especially about the asterisk, because reviews are meant for you're making a purchase today on launch day, M and and granted, all of us wait, obviously, but most people buy things within the first few weeks of a product's release. That's when the majority of sales happen, uh, or, or maybe not even the majority of sales, but that's when a lot of the purchase decision happens, right? Uh, people review how it is and they may not buy it for six months but it sets in their mind whether they're gonna buy it or not and that's why the reviews are this is based on what it is today but i think it I mean, Tia's brings up a really good point it's worth keeping in mind hey this product may change might get worse probably going to get better over time yep uh thanks for that email keep those coming uh feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com also thanks to a brand new boss everyone please welcome into the tent uh taryn blake who just started backing us on patreon thank you taryn <laughs> Welcome. We're on a nice little streak here of having a brand new uh, patron supporter every day. So we really appreciate that. We make a big deal uh, and everyone will say hi in the Discord and welcome you into the community. So if you're wanting that and you want to directly support the show, get the ad free feed and all that stuff, patreon.com slash DTNS. Thank you, Scott Johnson. Uh, real quickly before we get out of here, what do you got going on? Well, as you know, it's Halloween week and every year on a now old show that I do called Film Sacks, been around since 2009, every year in October, we do what we call Sacktober, where we take all four of the weeks in October and do Halloween themed films, old ones, new ones, everything in between. We are covering Freddy versus Jason this week. And so I'm just saying, if you've been sitting on the side going, man, I really meant to check out that awesome film show called Film Sack for all these years, maybe now's the time because we had a really good time watching it. We'll have a great time recording it. That's filmsack.com for all the details. The podcast can be found anywhere. And if you're looking to tag me in real life and uh, real time, find me on Twitter. I'm at twitter.com slash Scott Johnson. We are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 20.30 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>